Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on oneness in Christ. And this particular lesson is entitled Images of Unity. It's the lesson for November 10 of 2018. It's number six in, in this series. Images of Unity. We've been talking about unity. What would be images of unity? Well, we'll find out. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we once again open your word, think about your thoughts, or try to think your thoughts behind you, may we uh, gather wisdom from on high as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't have to tell any of you that the use of illustrations is in, uh, and images is a time-honored teaching technique. I mean, think of what you had back in the first grade, in the second grade, in the third grade. The teachers are using all kinds of pictures and felts and who knows what back in those days, and now it's got to be on the computer or on your iPad or whatever. All kinds of ways of teaching things, right? Well, the Bible itself is filled with images and symbols that point to things greater than themselves. So what is a symbol? It's a pointer, okay? It says, okay, this word means that collection of ideas, right? So the whole sacrificial system, for example, introduced at the gates of Eden, pointed to the reality of Jesus and the entire plan of salvation. Isn't that a good illustration? So here we have the whole sacrificial system. We can mention that in a couple words. Pointing to the whole plan of salvation, we can, mix, mix, we can mention that in a few words. But in other words, we're using a, a, a few symbols here as pointers to a much larger thing. Well, think of some common illustrations used in Scripture. The Lamb means... Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The wind. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Oil. Holy Spirit. Okay, there's just some simple illustrations. <clears throat> so what biblical images describe the kind of unity that God wants in His church? Sometimes we focus on individuals. We talk about how we as individuals need to represent Christ. But what about the church as a whole? Shouldn't the church as a whole represent Christ? What does your community think of Seventh-day Adventism? based on what your church is doing. Look at some very important passages in Scripture that illustrate this point. What did God want us to be? Carrie? I'm going to read from four different areas in the Bible. They all come from the Good News Translation. First is 1 Peter 2.9. But you are the chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous light. Next is Exodus 19, verses 5 to 6. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own people. The whole earth is mine, but you will be my chosen people, a people dedicated to me alone, and you will serve me as priests. I, let me interrupt there for just a second. It's interesting that it's almost the exact same wording here in this statement made just before the Mount Sinai experience, and Peter is using that those same ideas, talking not about the Jewish nation, but about who? Christian church. The Christian church, yes. Go ahead. Deuteronomy 4, verse 20. But you are the people he rescued from Egypt, that blazing furnace. He brought you out to make you his own people as you are today. Then we move along to Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. Do this because you belong to the Lord your God. From all the peoples on earth, he chose you to be his own special people. Okay. Do we look and act as if we are God's chosen people? Just asking. Always ready to serve as priests to the world? Are we willing, to, willing and ready to accept God's covenant promises? Well, if this is a covenant, what does covenant mean? 
an agreement. It's a legal instrument. Yeah, it's a covenant. It's a it's a, an agreement, a, a cooperation. In this case, it's God promising if if we do things, He'll do some things, right? Yes. Jackie, I think you know have some words on that. Exodus thirty-four, six to seven. The Lord then passed in front of him and called out, "I, the Lord, am a God who is full of compassion and pity, who is not easily angered." and who shows great love and faithfulness. I keep my promise for thousands of generations and forgive evil and sin, but I will not fail to punish children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation for the sins of their parents. Wow. God acquired the church as his own special possession in order that its members might reflect his precious traits of character in their own lives and proclaim his goodness and mercy to all men. SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7. Okay, so why did God choose the Israelites to be his special people? Yeah, that's a good puzzle. Dennis? Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 to 8. <clears throat> Do this because you belong to the Lord your God. From all the peoples of, uh, on earth, he chose you to be his own special people. The Lord did not love you and choose you because you outnumbered other peoples. You were the smallest nation on earth. But the Lord loved you and wanted to keep the promise that he made to your ancestors. That is why he saved you by his great might and set you free from slavery to the king of Egypt. From the Good News Bible. We know that Abraham is known as the father of the faithful. Were the children of Israel chosen just because of him? Don't everybody speak at once. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds at least partly for that reason, right? Yeah. yeah. Moses the assured them. The promises he had made to yeah. his ancestors. Mm -hmm. Moses assured them that God had made a promise to their ancestors. Well, who are the Christian ancestors? Can we claim Jesus Christ himself and the disciples as our ancestors in Christ? We can even include Abraham. Sure. Here, if we are. Of Sons faith, and daughters of faith, Abraham. Yeah, yes. then we are. That's all the faith. Okay. Yeah. If I have a globe here right now showing all the countries of the world, can you point out the holy nation for me? It's not a land based. <laughs> not a geographic area. Not a geographic area. Well, there's some nations who've tried to claim in the past that their leader or their leaders have tried to claim that they had a holy, holy nation, and maybe some nations are a little closer to God than others, but none of us are even close to being a really, truly holy nation. So, where is this holy nation? Wherever there are believers. Yes. Okay. So how does it impact your day-to-day -day behavior to know that you are one of the people of God? Exciting? First of all, we need to understand that winning the great controversy was done by God himself. Now let's be clear, we didn't win this. We were not there, we had no part in that victory. So what is God's part and what is our part? Well, God won the great controversy at Calvary 2,000 years ago and maybe including the resurrection was part of it. Even though we did not have any part in that, God has asked us to understand and share that good news with the world. Does that so mean... If, if everything was won 2,000 years ago, why are we here now? We must have some part in the great controversy, why it's continuing. I just asked you about what it is we have to do. Yeah. Maybe we haven't figured out what the real message is. Well, that might be a problem, too. <laughs> if God is, God wants to get a message out. He wants, God wants to bring this whole thing to a conclusion, but he can't bring the things to a conclusion until the great controversy is resolved and the questions are provided and everybody in the world has had a chance, at least superficially, to understand what the issues are. So, Gordon, I think there's something about building temples there. From 1 Peter 2, verse 5, Come as living stones, and let yourselves be used in building the spiritual temple 
where you will serve as holy priests to offer spiritual and acceptable sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. Well, is it possible? It could be possible that Peter was thinking of Paul's discussion in Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Uh, you want to read that? In reading that, so then you Gentiles are not foreigners or strangers any longer. You are now fellow citizens with God's people and members of the family of God. You too are built upon the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself. I'm going to interrupt you for just a second. Where is that foundation? Where do we find that today? Is it over in uh, Jerusalem? <coughs> is it in Mecca? Jesus, Jesus is the cornerstone, so it must be in heaven. We've been raised up and seated with him in heavenly But places. I have to have access to this. Where, where do I get access to it? Well, you're, you're already there in spirit. He has raised okay. us up together with him and seated him with uh, seated us with him in heavenly places. So okay. uh, we're not just uh, here, we're <coughs> we're also there in spirit. Okay. This is a figure of speech. Okay, of and, speech. and that's what we're talking about here. So what does this figure of speech refer to? Probably in those days it was the Old Testament. I mean that's isn't that the, and then now we have the New Testament, isn't that what our foundation is built on? I mean the Bible. here we have it. The Bible, right? The words Jesus said, the words he has spoken will be your judge. Yep. And what is it where do we get the words? We most of it we get in the gospels in one form or another. Or we yep. get glimpses of it in the Old Testament. The majority you have to use the words of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Continuing from Ephesians two, now verse twenty one. He is the one who holds the whole building together and makes it grow into a sacred temple dedicated to the Lord. In union with him, you too are being built together with all the others into a place where God lives through his spirit. So if we are living stones and we're built into a joint temple of some kind, we're just sitting there and doing nothing? No, it's a living, t uh, they're living stones. This is living stones. So what do living stones do? Well, did, the maybe I should say, what did David Livingstone do? Yeah, well, the, <laughs> yeah, the analogy sometimes breaks down if you push it too hard, but the idea is that, that uh, we're, we're an active group. Yeah. It's the, the church and uh, we're, we're the, the temple. We know you not that you are the te temple of the Holy Spirit. So Okay. So, I mean, a, a, a sacred building, a temple, I mean, look at, look at St. Peter's Church in, in Rome, uh, look at uh, the, the, the sample, the, it's a miniature sample of what the temple was like in Jerusalem. Think of the Parthenon in Athens. People go and look at those things and, and what, why do they do that? What are they expecting to see there? Art. Art, okay. It's glimpses of the past. Glimpses, glimpses from of the where, past? Well, okay. I just know the first time when I was in Italy and I walked down, I don't remember the town we were in, and thinking these stones have been here since Christ. Mm. Mm -hmm. There was something very real about being you know, we don't have that here in the United States. Yeah. There's no place we're going to walk and get that same feeling, so. Yeah. Okay. So, these are, these are symbols, once again, temples, whatever they are, they, they're supposed to be saying something to us about the message that the builders were trying to put across, right? The, the church in Rome, this is supposed to be talking about the grandeur and the magnificence of the Roman Catholic Church, right? I'm, I'm not saying it does that, I'm, but I, that's what was supposed to happen, right? It might be just to bedazzle the masses. Well, that, that can happen too. So what do we mean when we say Jesus is the foundation or the chief cornerstone? I thought Jesus contradicted that one time. Remember what it says in Matthew 16? Is that a contradiction? 
Uh, hold on here. Let's go to Matthew 16, verse 18. If I can get there. And so I tell you, Peter, you are a rock. And on this rock foundation, I will build my church and not even death will ever be able to overcome it. Isn't that, um, doesn't that tell us that the rock the church is built on Peter? No. No. Uh, Left out the meaning of the Greek words. <laughs> One's a pebble, the other one is the foundation. Okay. The Greek words are different there, aren't they? Yes. One is a bedrock type thing, the other is a pebble, a stone that you could throw. throw. And he goes, yeah? As you read on, no, I guess that's what you're going to say. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven, and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. So isn't Peter the one who was given the keys? Hmm. And then a few verses later, the apostles, Hold all the on, apostles are given the keys. Thing. Yeah, if you go back over to chapter 18, and I don't know what happened to my... It went to massive size. Anyway. While you're fixing that. Yes. Uh, in uh, Revelation, when it talks about the New Jerusalem, the gates are the tribes of the of, uh, 12 twi tribes of sons of Israel, but the 12 foundation stones are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So Peter would have been amongst those. Yes. Okay. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 3.11 tells us, For God has already placed Jesus Christ as the one and only foundation, and no other foundation can be laid. So what does it mean to suggest that we are part of the household of God? When someone uses the word home, what pops into your head? Family. Mm -hmm. Fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, right? What kind of relationship develops between individuals who grow up in the same home? Lots of yelling and screaming. <laughs> Sometimes. Okay. But many stories, many stories could be told about the incredible loyalty that members of a home have demonstrated toward other members of the same family. And I will tell you, um, this has happened many times, and I'm sure we've all observed this, you can see brothers and sisters who are fighting and carrying on like this, but as soon as someone tries to attack the family from outside, what happens? Yeah. Okay. Blood is Another. thicker than water. <laughs> Blood is thicker than water. Okay. So, what is God trying to tell us when he says we're part of the household of God? We're one family. with him. Do we feel a loyalty for other members of the church? We should. What, what happens when someone attacks the Adventist church? Do we pretend like... You, you don't know who they're talking about? Diplomatically try to turn it around. I see, okay. It's difficult, though, when it's another Adventist that's attacking the yeah. Adventist church. Well, that's a question. That's a problem. Yeah. Well, we are related to everybody in the church, not only through Adam and Noah, and you could figure out, okay, you can trace those back if you believe the Bible story, which I do, but we're also related to the new birth experience through Jesus, from Jesus Christ. And we have some words about that. You got, Myra, that's yes. you. Yes, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 from the Good News Bible. Surely you know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you. So if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you yourselves are his temple. And then from 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who lives in you and who is given to you by God? You do not belong to yourselves, but to God. He bought you for a price. So use your bodies for God's glory. Okay. So what does that imply? When it says use your bodies, does that mean we're out there supposed to be standing in line or we're supposed to be... How do you... Or does whatever it mean... 
whatever the spirit directs us and there are okay. different uh, we'll get on to the body you know having different members and shortly here mm -hmm. okay and so not everybody has the same exact uh, marching orders as far as wh exactly. exactly what they're going to do so it turns out that uh, there are different parts to the body and each part if everything's working right does what it's supposed to do right so in the church there are some pastors and some evangelists and some teachers and some missionaries and all those things well what do you think paul had in mind when he referred to the corinthians with their squabbles misunderstandings and sins as the temple of the holy spirit huh was he trying to butter them up or what was happening there maybe that was the goal <laughs> maybe that was a goal well to i mean if, if of course the spirit is what uh, who uh, binds us together if if you say well then uh, they couldn't have had the spirit because there were problems you, you're saying that if you have the spirit then everything is perfect mm -hmm. that everybody does everything just the right way and apparently it's not that way you you can have the holy spirit but you may uh, there's uh, the old man of sin and the new man of, in christ there's a war that Paul talks about. Between one wars against the other. The spirit wars against the flesh. So uh, sometimes people get stuck in a fleshly mode. Was Paul trying to remind the Corinthians that they represent Christ? Yes. Mm -hmm. And they need to... How, do, how should we respond if somebody either from inside the church or outside the church tries to attack it? We should defend it. They call those apologists. Okay. <laughs> and we should we should prevent we should defend it by presenting the truth, not by some made up schemes or whatever. People have tried some very crazy things to try to defend the church from time to time, and that's God doesn't ask us to do that. He said, "Tell the truth." Yeah. Tell them what Jesus has done for you. So where do conflicts within the church come from? Unconverted uh, hearts. Differences of opinion, yes? And unconverted hearts. Okay, that's very When they lively. were waiting for the Holy Spirit to fall, how they um, repented, they confessed their unbelief, they uh, made a way for God to come into them more fully, and that gave them a different point of view, plus other things, but... Um, Sometimes when I hear about things going on in the church, he tries to hide me from most of it. But <laughs> I do ask him questions from time to time. I'm actually, I'm appalled at some of the things that go on in meetings and things. And it's like, is this a redneck rally? What? You're mm -hmm. all men of God. Yep. I, uh, well, Paul specifically talks about envy, strife, and divisions. 1 Corinthians 3, yeah. 2. There are certainly plenty of those in the church of Corinth. As we know from our previous studies in the book of Acts, Paul wrote a very strong letter to the Corinthians after they rebuked and rebuffed him following a second brief visit there. We know his first visit, he went there and he spent about a year and a half. And it looked like everything was doing fine, it was settled down, the church is strong, it was working well. He went away for a period of time, worked in, in all the way back to his home church in Antioch, then he came back to Ephesus, was working in Ephesus, and rumors came to him that things were not doing so well back in Corinth. And from what we can tell, we can't be sure, but it looks likely that he took a boat trip from Ephesus across to Corinth. And on the right times of the year and the right conditions, that can be a very brief, brief, quick, a brief trip. It wouldn't take long at all. And the people in Corinth were nasty to him. They rebuffed him. They were not nice to him at all. He got back on the boat, went back to Ephesus, and thought, what in the world am I going to do now? And apparently, he wrote, sat down and wrote a pretty tough letter, very strong letter to them. And we may have part or all of that in 2 Corinthians 10 through 13. Anyway, the language is pretty blunt. 
and he sent it with Titus, who carried it all the way to Corinth. He walked around all the way to Corinth, delivered the letter, and what did he? What happened after that? Anybody remember the story? They accepted the rebuke, and they said, Paul, you're right. Please come back. Yeah. yeah. And he came back and spent the winter of 80, 57, 58 with them. And what did he do while he was there? Anybody remember? He wrote the books of Galatians and Romans during that time. Well, so now we have a fairly lengthy passage talking about the different parts of the church. Um, Jim? 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 26. Christ is like a single body which has many parts. It is still one body, even though it is made up of different parts. In the same way, all of us, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, have been baptized into the one body by the same Spirit, and we have all been given the one spirit to drink. For the body itself is not made up of only one part, but of many parts. If the foot were to say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not keep it from being part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not keep it from being a part of the body. If the whole body were just an eye, how could it hear? And if we're only one ear, how could it smell? As it is, however, God put every different part in the body just as he wanted it to be. There would be no, excuse me, there would not be a body if it were all only one part. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Gary, I think you have another part of that passage. <clears throat> yes, I do. So then, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor can the head say to the feet, well, I don't need you. On the contrary, <coughs> we can, cannot do without the parts of the body that seem to be weaker. And those parts that we think aren't worth very much are the ones which we treat with greater care. While the body while the parts of the body which don't look very nice are treated with special modesty, which the more beautiful parts do not need. God himself has put the body together in such a way as to give greater honor to those parts that need it. And so, there is no division in the body, but all its parts have the same concern for one another. If one part of the body suffers, all the other parts suffer with it. If one part is praised, all the other parts share its happiness. Good News Bible, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 26. Very good. I can tell you that in my business, it's very obvious that one even fairly tiny part is giving trouble, people rush in, oh, you got to do something about my ear, or you got to do something about my toe. And I mean, that's just a, we don't say to them, well, that's just a tiny part, just we'll email. cut it off. I got an email problem. <laughs> right there, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, we want all the parts to be working together. So why does it work that way in the church? Why can't we say, well, you know, let's all get together, let's all cooperate? Why, why can't we do that? Well, let's give another illustration. When a baby is born, the first thing everybody wants to know is, Are they is okay? it normal? Are there 10 fingers and 10 toes? Yes. Even a small abnormality, and I can tell you there are some tribal areas in Africa where it's fairly common for children to be born, be born with six fingers mm -hmm. and six toes. 12 and 12. Mm -hmm. So, even a small abnormality in any part of the body is considered to be a disaster. What should that teach us about the church? Well, not everyone can be the same part of the body. 
Now, we might have an argument about that. How many people want to be the head? Well, Christ is the head. Yes, okay, good. But I, I can tell you there's a lot of people who'd like that job. Every part of the body has its designated use, and if it were possible for the individual parts of the body to speak, they would praise each other for faithfully doing what they were supposed to do. I used to think about this, and I, I guess, Gordon, I should ask you this. This is kind of your department. Technically, we have an entire body to carry around a brain. That is correct. That's, that's the whole purpose of the heart, the lungs, the Every kidneys, the muscle. We've it's had all, this discussion before. It's all to carry around the brain. Okay. Does he well, sound really like what a neurologist? Person is, is what yes. I think. That, that is right. That's and it's person. not just it's but not just the brain the step. Heart to it's the, the, it's the frontal lobes. Low. Yes. It's that dis, that discerning uh, yes. parts of the brain. Exactly. And you, when you have the lose the capacity to think and to do, you really are not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a man thinketh, so is he. Isn't that the mm -hmm. text? And if you're not thinking or not doing, you. You're not. Yeah. Yeah, the brain I... brain doesn't function very well if it doesn't have a heart. Right. Yeah, well, th we, we have, we're dependent upon other things, but yes. some things are more important than others. Hearts are We don't important. function well at all. We don't function well at all without a brain either. Yeah. So... <laughs> we call that brain dead. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, Carrie, I think you have something more on that. Yes, this comes from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, November 7. Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 12 conveys the profound reality that authentic Christian unity is not just in diversity, and certainly not despite diversity, but rather through diversity. We should not be surprised let, that... Let me, let me stop you there. What does he mean by saying that? Not in diversity, not despite diversity, but rather through diversity. What, what's he trying to say to us? That we need all the parts. Well, we need, yes? Yeah, some people might say, well, diversity is the, the main thing. Trying to defend their, their situation of being different. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's through, how did he put it here? Uh, and it's not despite diversity, but uh, as if that was a problem, uh, uh, not a, um, a, a problem that couldn't be overcome, but rather through the, the difficulties of being diverse. There's a, several places where Ellen White says a couple of pastors were sort of squabbling about, well, you know, I'm the chief pastor here, I'm the chief evangelist or whatever, and you're just my helper. And, and that, the, she said, no, it's not like that. When people go out to, as a team to evangelize, one person appeals to one particular group of people and the other one says things a little different, a little different way, appeals to another group of people. It's not a question of, and I think of the story of the, um, the male brothers in, 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 <laughs> in Rochester, uh, Minnesota. Um, one time a guy came charging, in the, came all the way, I think, from Washington, D.C. and thought he was very important and he walked into this guy and, and they had sort of divided up the, the body and I've forgotten exactly how to but but one of, one of them was dealing with the stomach and the intestines and the heart and the lungs and so forth and the other one was dealing with the brain and so forth like this. He says, guy comes in and he pounds his fist on this, says, I need to see the head doctor right away. And he said, well, the head doctor's in there. I'm just a stomach doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in other words, you probably need to, you got a psychiatric problem. <laughs> well, so just as the human body is both, I'm sorry, Carrie, you can tell us the rest of that. We should not be surprised that it is the Holy Spirit who is the source of these expressions of diversity. Just as the human body is both incredibly unified and amazingly diverse, so ideally is the body of Christ which through this diversity expresses the completeness and richest, richness of the body of Christ. So, if we are indeed God's final end time remnant church, and don't we claim that we're that? Mm -hmm. 
We get that from the book of Revelation, we think, anyway, right? We need to be reaching out to every part of the world, right? So it's no problem. Dennis, you speak Swahili perfectly well, right? Not that I know of. You, you mean you can't? You hear me in the night. Uh, <laughs> you, can't, you can't speak. Gordon, you must speak Chinese. I haven't learned it yet. Jim, what about uh, German? How's your German? Not, not good. <laughs> not good. So that was a, actually it was a waste of time. I'd be much better <laughs> yeah. to learn Spanish because I don't oh. talk. No, I took several years of Spanish and didn't help too much. Yeah, but I, I worked with people that spoke Spanish for years, and I could say po poquito, bueno, no bueno, pa pasa mañana, but that was about the limit. So. Okay. Well, anyway, the, the, that's just an illustration of the fact that we need a lot of people speaking different languages, appealing to different groups of people. We need, we need people who can speak to business people. We need people who can speak to teachers. We need people who can speak to other pastors. We need people who can speak to ordinary, uneducated people. We need, we need all those kinds of people. So what are we saying? These are the different parts of the body, right? No single individual or single cultural group could possibly do that, I mean, to speak to everybody. We need people of all languages, nationalities, tribes, cultures, etc., to help us finish the gospel, finish the work, right? Every one of us is dependent upon what Christ has done for us for salvation. If we recognize this common factor, we should be willing to work together as a single body. Another image that is very that is used very effectively in the Bible is the image of the shepherd with the sheep. And I think we've got a moment. Let me read that. John 10, verses 1 through 11. Jesus said, I am telling you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who goes into the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. So what's the, what's, the work, what's the work of the gatekeeper and what's the work, gate, work, work of the shepherd here in those first couple of verses? The gatekeeper is, is the security man and the shepherd knows them all by name and the idiosyncrasy. And, and, and yeah, exactly. And so when the, the, the man comes up to the gate, the shepherd comes up to the gate, what does the, what does the gatekeeper do? Through. So come on in. And then the guy starts calling out names or whatever he, he whistles his tune or whatever it is. And who comes? His flock. Those sheep that belong to him. When he's brought them out, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow someone else. Instead, they will run away from such a person because they do not know his voice. Jesus told them this parable, but they did not understand what he meant. It's a lot, and it seems so obvious to me. Why? Well, so Jesus said again, I'm telling you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. What's implied by that? He's the, he the way in. Okay. Yeah. Nobody comes to the Father but by me, right? I am the gate for the sheep. All others who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever comes in by me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come in order that you might have life, life in all its fullness. I am the good shepherd who is willing to die for the sheep. When the hired man who is not a shepherd does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and runs away. So the wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them. The hired man runs away because he's only a hired man, does not care about the sheep, and, and so forth. So Jesus called himself not only the shepherd, but also the gate to the sheepfold. So we've already suggested that the gate is the way in, the way out. We've, we've suggested that the shepherd is the one who leads. Middle Eastern shepherds lead their sheep. They do not drive them. Now in America, the shepherd does, if you really have a big flock of sheep, how do you take care of them? You drive them and you have dogs barking on the sides. Usually you drive them, sometimes you, you're riding a horse or something like that, and you have dogs running around nipping at the sheep. That's not the way the Middle Eastern people do it. 
The sheep follow because they recognize the voice of their shepherd. The sheep goes ahead and smooths the path. I mean, so the shepherd goes ahead and smooths the path, removes the hazards, making sure that it is safe for the sheep to follow. Christ has become, has been to everything for us. Could we ever claim that we have faced difficulties that he has not faced? Could we ever claim that he is not an adequate shepherd? I certainly hope nobody would make that kind of a claim. Christ also describes himself as the gate. What does that mean? In small Middle Eastern communities, there's a, sometimes a single sheepfold where a sheep of multiple shepherds are kept together. There's only one entrance, and that entrance is usually guarded. Thieves might try to claim over the back fence in one way or another to steal sheep, but the shepherd comes to, to the gate, calls his sheep, and the sheep that belong to him follow him. Now, what does that imply for Christians, if we understand that paradigm, that idea about a shepherd? We need to know the voice of our shepherd. Mm -hmm. When the false Christ, the false messiahs come, we read about in Matthew 24, what's going to happen? It'll be the wrong voice. If we are God's two sheep, we're not going to be deceived, not going to be misled, right? How will we know that voice? That's obviously a figure of speech. So what it means is that we have read the Bible, we understand it, and we know what God is going to say when he comes. And we or know we know what he won't say when he comes. Yes. And we know that he won't change some things. He won't try to discredit the Bible and change it to other things. Well, are are you happy to be called a sheep? Yes. You are, huh? Yep. I think that's a beautiful uh analogy. Mhm. Mm and sheep are stupid too. They also go astray. Yeah. And they get caught in all kinds of brambles and pitfalls. Well, sheep are helpless and defenseless creatures, mm -hmm. by and large. They have no horns, they have no fangs with which to defend themselves or to attack a potential enemy. When facing danger, they often encircle themselves so their faces are inside the circle and their woolly backsides are facing outwards. And what's the reason for that? Plenty That's the least vulnerable part of them. Yeah, plenty of wool there. Hopefully. Yeah, and you... If, the, if a wolf comes along and bites, all he gets is a big mouthful of wool, right? Well, <clears throat> huddling together is their safety mechanism. Does that tell us anything? We need to press together. Press together. Press together, press together, right? Mm -hmm. Often a shepherd discovers that one of his sheep has wandered off. What does he do? Looking for it. Goes out searching for it. And almost he will search almost endlessly for the lost, that lost, one lost sheep. And especially if it's a lamb, he then might even need to carry that lamb home on his shoulders. You've seen pictures of that kind of rescue. How important is this for us? How important is it for us as Christians to follow the voice of our shepherd? Are we daily listening to God's word and to the advice of our shepherd? As we know, the church has all kinds of problems. At one point, Ellen White was led to say, Jackie? The church, enfeebled and defective, needing to be reproved, warned, and counseled, is the only object upon earth upon which Christ bestows his supreme regard. Wonderful. The world is a workshop in which, through the cooperation of human and divine agencies, Jesus is making experiments by his grace and divine mercy upon human hearts. Ellen G. White Review and Herald. September 5, 1893, oh, wow. But in feeble and defective as we may be, we have a faithful Savior. He gave all for us. Dennis, I think that's yours. The soul that has given himself to Christ is more precious in his sight than the whole world. The Savior would have passed through the agony of Calvary that one might be saved in his kingdom. Mm. He will never abandon one for whom he has died. Unless his followers choose to leave him, he will hold them fast. Desire of Ages uh, 480, paragraph 5. Wow, what does that tell you? The Savior would have passed through the agony of Calvary that one might be saved in his kingdom. Jesus would have died just for you. 
Well, we're told that God so loved the world, John 3.16. Do we understand the implications of that? Gordon? From Desire of Ages, page 483. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. That is, my Father has so loved you, that he even loves me more for giving my life to redeem you. These are the words of Jesus. In becoming your substitute and surety by surrendering my life, by taking, my, by taking your liabilities, your transgressions, I am endeared to my Father. Wow. Think about that. Is it really possible for the Father to love the Son more because of what he did here on planet Earth? Is that really even possible? I believe it. <laughs> well, it Don't seems you know. somewhat of a shared experience that they hadn't gone through before. Yeah. God so loved and, and Jesus uh, also loved so that he could redeem us. Well, if you travel through the Middle East, almost every ancient city will have the ruins of a fairly impressive temple structure of, of some kind. Uh, there are many of the ancient cities, if you travel to them, have multiple temples. I mean, temples to Caesars and temples to assorted pagan gods and maybe a Christian temple or something like that there, or a Jewish temple. Well, those temples were built to honor pagan gods and sometimes even to honor Caesars. But the temple in Jerusalem, impressive as it was in the days of Solomon, what was it called? One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and again in the days of Jesus. What do we call the one in the days of Jesus? Herod's, Herod's temple. Herod's temple. It, how much is left of that? Destroyed. Wailing wall. One part of one outside wall. Yeah. There's no central temple erected in honor of God. There's no place in the world to which we must make some kind of pilgrimage to worship Him. This is not Mecca. Instead, God chooses to make a temple out of each of His children. God is a living temple and it is scattered all over the world. Is it obvious to our neighbors and friends? Well, we have reviewed several images from Scripture. Do you have a fa favorite image from Scripture about Christ, about the unity of the church, or one of the ones? Yes. Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things are created in the heaven and the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So Jesus is the image of the one you're never going to see. Yep. 1 John 1, 1.18 and 6.46. Very good. It's interesting to notice that each member of the God is involved in one or more of the symbols. And if we had time, we would show how each member of the Godhead tries to honor the others. Just like that. But we've seen so far, we've talked about the people of God. That sort of implies the Father. The household of God. The temple of the Holy Spirit. And the body of Christ. Now, why, why do you suppose we have those different nomen, that different nomenclature? Those are finite descriptions of the one infinite creator God. Okay, is this, is this just God's way of spreading out the credit for what's being done on, to build up his church? Well, we tend to think in finite terms. You know, we don't always get the big picture, so it's an accommodation perhaps to, um, for communication purposes. Maybe <clears throat> in interfacing with us, they chose different roles to to accomplish what they did. Instead of three gods on three thrones, they the Father dwells in light unapproachable on a throne high and lifted up. Jesus mm -hmm. is Emmanuel, God with us, so he has a created form and uh, the Holy Spirit is is our connection to God. Okay. Within. So there's the God up there, the God within and 
and that was what was lost in our fall was we lost uh, that connection to. Yes, Gordon. These are all figures of speech mm -hmm. trying to help us learn something that we're going to spend the rest of eternity learning about yes. God. Do we really need diversity in God's church? Yes. Different parts of the body, as mm -hmm. Paul explained. I really need my mitochondria. You do? Nobody ever sees those things. Yes. And look at all the work they do. Mm -hmm. And that's it is how it is with the church. Mm -hmm. I mean, every part is necessary. Do we all understand? And you out there, do you understand why the church needs its diversity? You can talk about diversity, but there was a quotation from uh, Ellen White uh, called Lift Him Up. I don't know exactly when that was published, but anyway, there's a statement there. The principle here given is, is a natural outgrowth of the Christian religion, especially will those who are engaged in proclaiming the last solemn message to a dying world seek to fulfill this scripture, although possessing different temperaments and dispositions, they will see eye to eye in all matters of religious belief. They will speak the same things, they will have the same judgment, they will be one in Jesus oh, Christ. That's, a, that's a state of atonement, and that's mm -hmm. what Jesus uh, and God has always done to, to bring harmony to all of his creation. Yeah. Well, there are many ways in which our individual experiences of life can illustrate some of the images that we've studied in this lesson. The story is told about a young woman that uh, got an edu became educated as a nurse in one country, and then she chose to go to another country to work. And when she first got there, here were people from a number of different countries were, were working in this particular hospital. But pretty soon she realized, well, we have a common task that we need to do. She got acquainted with them. She learned a bit about their families. They became friends. So at first, then the, the, the strangeness was wore away, and a variety of people from different countries were there. After a while, their common challenges at work brought them closer and closer together. Each day as they celebrated the healings and mourned together the deaths at the hospital, they grew closer to each other. Their common experiences soon made them close friends. Can we learn something from such a story about how we should work as a church? Common goals. Mm -hmm. What would happen? You know that Ellen White once said that, and maybe more than once, but once I know it for sure, she said, we should have a Sabbath sometime when the, the, the whole Sabbath is dedicated to individual members in the church standing up and giving testimonies, talking about, you know, what God has done to them, what kind of maybe people they have brought to the church, whatever like this. Just individual testimonies. The whole service should be individual testimonies. Now that wouldn't work too well in a church with 7,000 members like our church, but it could work in smaller churches. Well, they, they, they've had individual testimonies sure. in recent months uh, of focusing on one special person or another, but not everybody coming yeah. up. We know that God has called us individually to represent Him in our daily lives. Is there a different sense in which a church as a collective body is supposed to represent God? Does your church clearly represent God to the community in which you live? Does the community recognize that? You know, one illustration that has been mentioned is Sometimes people will go to a big sporting event of some kind, and when you sit down, there'll be a certain card of a certain color. And, okay, so I've got this card that's yellow, let's say. And you wonder what in the world is going on, but then you, you, you sit there with the understanding that when someone gives a signal, what are you gonna do? Put it up. You're gonna hold it up, and all of a sudden, when everybody holds up the, the right colored card and the right thing, what do you see? You see a picture. Now your particular card has how many colors? One. One, but you're a part of a bigger picture. So could that be maybe somehow a, an example of how the church ought to represent God in some, in some respects? Well, different people will respond to different, to, you know, one won't respond to, uh, everybody 
They mm -hmm. may respond to just one. They yeah. may not feel comfortable around someone else. So each one of us can be uh, a channel of grace. It's interesting to note that Paul wasn't the first one to talk about unity in, in, in a group. Some of the Greek, ancient Greek politicians and, and, he, and, and Roman politicians talked about unity and, and put together the, the, the state being a, like parts of a body. But what did they mean? They meant we are the, we are the people at the top here, we're like the head, and all the rest of you people are supposed to serve us. That was what they meant by different parts of the body. Paul's picture was very different. He talked about a unified, mutually dependent body. And what does that mean? Do we have some people who are the head and they just say, the rest of you people are just, ah, just ancillary services. Does the, does the brain say to the heart, I don't really need you, go away? That wouldn't work too well, right? No. Does any part of the body say to the liver, we don't really need you? Wouldn't work too well. It won't do it for very long. <laughs> Not for very long. And would we say, well, we don't need those intestines. They're just full of junk anyway. Right? No, we, 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 want, we, we want those intestines to be there, to function the way they're supposed to. Yeah. And then there's the, those bones and muscles and all, and, and all that kind of stuff and tendons. What do we need all those things for? Well, you want to be able to grasp something. You want to be able to. Uh, we need them to get the brain to move the brain to different places that the brain needs to go. Yeah, it does that too. <laughs> and we, we we need we need them to reach out and grab onto the food to put it in our mouth so it can go to the stomach, or it can go to the intestines, it can go to the liver to provide nourishment for. Brain. That brain that's <laughs> <laughs> up there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, yes, it's very clear, I think, from lessons like this one, that we need to, we need to celebrate the differences, celebrate the diversity that we have among us. We may not always understand our brothers and sisters completely, but that day will come when we get to heaven. So I'm telling you all and all of you, celebrate your diversity. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for this lesson on images and diversity and how we can become better Christians by celebrating our diversity. May that be our experience as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.